We've spent some time now looking at how organisms interact in a community of different species and at how energy and nutrient resources move into and out of those organisms in an ecosystem. Now, the larger point of this discussion, I want to remind you, has been that we're trying to learn how energy and resources, and more specifically, how the fact that energy and resources often are limiting, can help us to understand the structure of living systems at the highest levels of organization in the biological hierarchy. That is, we want to understand how the availability and movement of energy and resources in communities and ecosystems can help us account for the abundance and distribution of species, which is a defining question in the field of ecology. But up to this point, we've really only been speaking in general terms. For example, we might predict that only a few top predators will occur in an ecosystem because low ecological efficiencies only allow a fraction of energy to penetrate to these higher trophic levels. But can we predict exactly which predator we'll find in an ecosystem? Similarly, we might predict that species in competition in a community will partition the resource over which they're competing in some way so that their niches don't completely overlap. But can we predict which of the many species that we might possibly find in a community will actually be the ones that we see there? Actually, to a surprisingly large degree, the answer to questions like these is no. We might be able to predict how many species we might find in an area, how many species or individuals of particular species we might find in different trophic levels, or even what kinds of ecological interactions we'd expect to see given the species that we do find someplace. But we can rarely, if ever, predict exactly which species we'll find. Now, this conclusion might sound discouraging after the discussions we've been having, but it really just reflects the fact that there are other factors that contribute to the abundance and distribution of species, factors that are not directly determined by resources or the distribution of those resources or any other kinds of limitations of that nature. Instead, these factors have to do with history and chance events. In other words, the particular set of species that we actually find living in some particular place may depend on evolutionary and geological history and the chance events that are associated with this history as much as it does on the present day conditions found in that area. So in today's lecture and in the next lecture, we're going to further broaden our discussion of ecology by asking, to the extent we can, what these other factors are, and how they influence the abundance and distribution of species. Now this discussion will get us closer to understanding what determines the structure and organization of communities and ecosystems, but as you'll see, some aspects of the structure and organization of living systems at this scale of the biological hierarchy are simply not fully predictable. Well, in the early days of the field of ecology, and by this I mean in the 1920s and 1930s when people started calling themselves ecologists, there were really two competing views about the degree to which communities and ecosystems were predictable. Frederick Clements, who was a Nebraskan botanist, argued that associations of organisms found in a community are highly adapted to live with each other. And therefore, because of these adaptions, adaptations, adaptations that, are, that have evolved because of the interactions among these species, these species would always be found in some uh, uh, associated fashion, linked together wherever they occur. In other words, you would find groups of species always associated together. Clements saw communities, therefore, as being highly predictable. If you just knew what factors to look at, you could say this association of species would have to be found there. Now, Clements drew an analogy between the species in, the com in a community and the various parts of a single organism's body. The parts of an organism can only exist within the integrated whole of that organism. In fact, Clements argued that communities and ecosystems functioned as kinds of superorganisms. He sort of saw the different species in a community as being like different organs in an organism. Every time you look at a particular organism, you'll find the same parts to that organism. They have to be together because that's how that organism functions. And that's the way that Clements viewed ecological communities. Every time you saw a particular community, you'd have to have the same species because those were necessary for that community to function. Now, another feature of Clements' views of ecological communities was that once they were established, they would remain stable over the long run. In a sense, Clements had a kind of homeostatic view of community stability. 
The community would resist any change from disturbances because interactions among species within that community would return it to its stable state, analogous to the way that homeostatic feedback mechanisms will return a physiological state to some set point. Clement's view became known variously as the organismic concept of community structure or the interactive concept of, immuni- of community structure or the holistic concept of community structure. All these terms referring to the idea that communities were necessarily integrated wholes. Now, a diametrically opposing view was championed at the same time by Henry Gleason, who was a botanist from the University of Chicago. Gleason argued that the particular assemblage of species you found in any particular community or ecosystem was neither predictable nor stable. Gleason's view was that the species found in any one place simply reflected the fact that they shared, that the fact that species might be found together in one place simply reflected the fact that these species shared an affinity for whatever attributes of that habitat happened to be, whatever the attributes of that habitat happened to be. Species in a community might interact, Gleason admitted, the kinds of ecological interactions we've talked about up to this point, but Gleason saw these as sort of secondary consequences. You throw some species in and they may or may not interact. That might affect the distribution or abundance of those species, but that wasn't the primary driver of what set up an ecological community. Furthermore, Gleason argued that if a community was disturbed, for example, by a fire or some other large disaster like that, then it would return to potentially a completely different state. The species that would end up after a disturbance in a community would be completely different than the species that you found before. Why? Because there was a random element to which species happened to be found in a particular place. Gleason's perspective has become known as the individualistic concept of community structure. In other words, we think of species individualistically as we think about where we might find them in any particular place on the planet. Now, Clement's holistic concept of communities as some sort of superorganism may seem a little extreme to us today, even if we'd like to think we could predict something about the associations of species we'd find in a community. But actually, the debate between Clements and Gleason lasted for a considerable period of time. And the reason for this is that many communities, at least at first glance, do appear to be somewhat predictable and stable over the long run. Specifically, many studies of how communities develop over time and how they recover from disturbances through a process known as ecological succession gave the appearance of considerable predictability. Let's take a look at ecological succession and how it works. So, a complex community, of course, something like a tropical rainforest or even a temperate forest or a grassland or even even an arctic tundra obviously just doesn't appear overnight. It takes time for ecological communities to develop. Now, the same is true if an existing community is perturbed seriously by some disturbance. If if fire destroys most of the organisms in a community, uh, for example, it'll take some time for that community to fill back up with organisms. The process by which a community of organisms develops over time is referred to as ecological succession. Now, ecological succession actually is divided into two sorts of succession. What we call primary succession refers to the development of a community essentially from scratch. Now, we actually see primary succession occurring all the time. For example, if a newly created volcanic island appears, then the colonization of that island by organisms would be an example of primary succession. Another example of primary succession is um, on uh, pieces of habitat that have been revealed by retreating glaciers, where in fact that habitat might have been covered for tens of thousands of years. Nothing has lived there, and it will be colonized anew, and we would call that primary succession. Now, secondary succession refers to the redevelopment of a seriously disturbed community. So, for example, if a forest has been cut down and the land plowed up for agriculture and then left to go fallow as um, people no longer farm that land, it will redevelop a community, and that process of redevelopment we call secondary succession. The real distinction between primary and secondary succession, by the way, is in secondary succession we assume that the soil is intact in an area. And as we've discussed, the soil can be a major repository of nutrients. So it's really whether you start nutrient-free or you're starting with some repository of nutrients to build on. Now, Frederick Clements, 
And many other early ecologists noticed that if all the trees are cleared from a patch of forest by a disturbance, such as fire or logging and farming, the first plants to reinvade that area when it's left on its own actually would be different from the species that were found there originally. However, they noticed that after some period of time, maybe as long a period as 100 years, eventually the tree species that were originally found at that site would come back and reappear. Furthermore, what they saw was that in many cases the community will progress through a predictable series of stages between the first species to appear um, after a disturbance and the appearance of the original species at some later time. Finally, after the original species do return to a disturbed site, these species will remain unchanged over the long term unless the community is disturbed again. So Clements and many others documented these patterns of predictable successional stages. And they, and they argued from these patterns that these successional stages themselves were predictable and would always lead back to what they called the climax community of a particular habitat. This is very much compatible with Clement's view of communities as superorganisms with some sort of homeostatic process. The process of succession was sort of the, the homeostatic return to the most stable state. Now, one of the best studied examples of this kind of secondary succession actually comes from work on abandoned agricultural fields in the Piedmont region of North Carolina. Throughout the eastern United States, as you probably know, many forested areas were logged and cultivated 200 years ago or more, but then eventually were abandoned and began to return to their wild state. This secondary succession from a field that was farmed to a more wild state is something we call old field succession. We call it old field succession because these are old fields that are being left to go wild. Now, in the Piedmont of North Carolina, as an example, Old field succession usually begins with the appearance of annual weeds in the first year after the field is abandoned. Okay? Farming is stopped. The next year, you'll see a bunch of annual weeds. Now, by annual, I simply mean species of plant that live only one year. So these species will come in, they'll live a year, they'll reproduce, but then they're dead, and only their offspring will be carried into the next, gen uh, into the next season. Now, after a couple of years, however, what you'll see is the appearance of other species, again of weeds, we call these weeds, by the way, because these are species that are adapted to colonize and dis to disperse far distances and to colonize an area rapidly. You'll see the appearance of perennial weeds, weeds that will actually stay around as individuals for a series of years. After maybe five years or so, what you'll see in an abandoned old field in North Carolina is the appearance of larger shrubby plants. And these shrubby plants will begin to dominate the habitat and essentially outcompete the smaller weeds that were there. Um, at the beginning. Now, if you wait a number of years after that, another five years or even longer or maybe sometimes shorter, what will happen is that pine trees will start growing in this field. And pretty soon, the field will have turned into a pine forest. Well, pine forests are not stable in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Instead, they're, instead, eventually, again, now in this case, it may take a matter of decades, what will happen is eventually other species of trees, specifically hardwood trees, most dominantly oaks, will begin to appear in these abandoned fields. And after some period of time, a period that may be 100 or 120 years, the oaks and other hardwoods like hickories will completely replace the pines. And if nothing else happens after that, the oak forest will remain a stable climax community. Now let me re-emphasize two very striking things about this progression. First, it appears that you do always end up in the same place. It's the oaks that always end up being the climax community in this uh, part of the world. Second, the transitional stages themselves seem to be predictable. You can, you can actually, if you're trained in this, I mean, if you're, if you're a field botanist, you can actually go and look at a patch of woodland and estimate how long ago it was abandoned based on the species that you see there, the kinds of species that you see. So it does seem to be quite predictable and seems to support Clement's view of stable and integrated communities. Now, one interesting, we might want to add, uh, interesting question we might want to ask now before we go on to Gleason's contrasting view of community stability is what mechanisms are responsible for this um, successional progression that we observe in nature.
I mean, aside from the fact that we seem to end up with the same species we started with, we might want to ask why it is that a patch of land has to go through this extended uh, series of different states to get back to where it started. Or in other words, why don't the species that were moved there um, originally simply reappear? Why doesn't an abandoned field start growing oak trees right away? Why does it take 100 years or at least 20 years before they start to appear? The answer to this question largely has to do with the life history, characteristics, life history characteristics of the species found in the community and ecological interactions among the species at various successional stages. Now, there are a couple of kinds of interactions in general that are particularly important to understanding succession. One of these is inhibition due to competition in which one species outcompetes another species and thus monopolizes the resources in a, in a habitat, keeping the other species out. This is the kind of competition we've talked about before. But the presence of one species may also eventually change the environment in which it lives, creating conditions that allow other species that couldn't live there well originally to start to move in. And this process we call facilitation. So let's consider these processes by going back and looking at this old field succession we've talked about. The first colonizers that move in, these annual weeds, are species that are, as I said, specialized for long distance dispersal and rapid reproduction. They take over first because they simply get there first, because their life history characteristics include a rapid and extended dispersal phase. So they find themselves first. They find themselves there first. Now, um, once these weeds have established themselves, though, they start actually changing the soil. As they die, they'll add nutrients to the soil. And in fact, they'll provide more structure to the soil. And so the presence of these um, annual weeds that first invade actually starts changing the habitat in a way that makes it easier for perennial weeds to follow them. And the perennial weeds then change the habitat even more, making it easier for shrubby species to come in. Now let's consider this, this transition from the pine trees to oak trees, which is particularly interesting. It turns out that pine trees, young pine trees, need a lot of light to grow. They're good at getting into fields that don't have any other trees because they're not competing with other trees for light that's impinging on that field. But once the pine forest has reached its own mature state, it's hard for young pine seedlings to grow up underneath it. Why? Because underneath the mature pine trees, there's much less light than these young pine trees need. Oak seedlings, on the other hand, actually do well in low light. So oak seedlings, when they find themselves starting to sprout underneath a pine forest, will do pretty well and those young oak trees will grow up and through the pines. Eventually the oak trees will shade out things as well, but their own offspring can continue to replace them. And so oaks are a climax community that will remain stable for an extended period of time. Well, this all sounds like Frederick Clemens pretty much had it right. But it turns out that studies of succession that were more um, detailed showed that it wasn't necessarily the case in most communities that you really had the same predictable progression leading to a same predictable endpoint. Now, Clement's, views, we might, Clement's view we might refer to as sort of an equilibrium model of community structure. But the alternative model that was proposed by Gleason, a non-equilibrium model, would predict that we would see variation both through progressions, uh, successional progressions, and in the endpoints. Now, there were two main kinds of studies that were done um, uh, later, in fact, especially in the 70s and 80s, that showed that this non-equilibrium or more dynamic views of, uh, view of communities was probably the more correct. Specifically, long-term studies of changes in forest communities across North America, long-term studies that would use fossil records of where species were occurring, including fossils of pollen, which are actually a quite, quite complete record of where trees have lived and when, showed that, in fact, over the last 10,000 years or so, not a very long period of time in ecological terms, the distribution of different species of trees in North American forests have shifted dramatically. Now maybe that isn't surprising. Different trees, different species of trees are found in different ranges through different times in say a 10,000 year period. But what is surprising from Clement's point of view is that these ranges shift independently of each other. 
In other words, changes in the range of one species of tree occur independently of changes in the range of any other species of tree. And this is contrary to Clement's view, because Clement's would argue that particular associations of species had to be found together. How could a range of one species change dramatically unless ranges of the other species in its community followed suit in the same geographical pattern? This wasn't the case, arguing that, in fact, Clement's view may not really have been as accurate, or uh, Clement's view may not actually really have captured the way that communities evolve. Now, you might say then, well, what about these successional studies that show such a regular progression? Well, it's very possible that in succession of old fields, for example, in North Carolina, the number of possible outcomes is relatively limited. There may not be that many species that could possibly invade and eventually take over, and so the fact that you find the same species of oak and hickory and so forth in the end point community may really still be a matter of chance only because it isn't as though there are that many options. Eventually those trees will get in there, give them a hundred years, but they're not getting in there because of specifically evolved so associations, this contrary um, view would argue. Now, there's an even better way to test this, and this would be to use experiments, to actually go in and manipulate communities and ask yourself, after you, for example, cause some radical disturbance to a community, does it or doesn't it come back, and to monitor that, monitor that community very carefully. Now, this can be done over the long term with forest communities, say, in the Piedmont of North Carolina, and it has been, been. but it's hard to monitor the, these communities on the fine scale that you'd really want to look at. In other words, you really want to ask, are these successional stages moving with the exact same species at the same time? It takes a long time and it's a lot of work. A different approach is to use some sort of community that you can experimentally manipulate much easier in a much shorter time scale. And an example of that kind of community is one that you can create, for example, in small experimental ponds, where the communities that you're interested in are the communities of zooplankton. These are the small animals, um, things like uh, uh, paramecia or rotifers or daphnia that we've talked about before, that will eventually take over that pond and create a kind of climax community, if you will, of these small zooplankton in that aquatic uh, habitat. Well, a very interesting experiment um, illustrates this kind of work, um, although there have been many of these kinds of experiments done. And, but the one I want to consider is a study published relatively recently by David Jenkins. Now, Jenkins set up a set of 12 experimental ponds, and the key point about these ponds is that they were all the same size, they all had the same kinds of materials that they were made out of. In other words, all of their shores and, and bottoms were made out of the same thing. And in fact, they, they almost occurred in exactly the same place. He just built these ponds in the same field. So the, the, con, the, uh, the overall conditions, the physical conditions of these ponds were identical. Now, once Jenkins had gotten these ponds established, of course, communities grew in these ponds. You can't keep living things out of ponds like this. But what he did was, at the same time, he shocked all of these ponds with chlorine. He chlorinated the ponds, which effectively killed everything in them. And then the chlorine was removed from the ponds, and he watched carefully, over the period of about a year, what happened to the species that got into the pond, and how those species changed over time, and what happened at the end point after a year. Now, what Jenkins found, and what similar studies have found in most cases, is that if you look carefully at this kind of experimental manipulation, the successional progression that you see is different for each pond. Specifically in Jenkins' case, what he found was that at the end point of these 12 ponds after a year, if you look just at the zooplankton species, you'd probably find on the order what he found was about 60 species total of different kinds of zooplankton across all 12 ponds. But if he looked at any one pond, he'd only find maybe a half or two-thirds of those species, maybe 30 or 40 of those species occurring in any one pond. And more interestingly, each pond would have a different collection of about 30 or so species. Not all ponds ended up with the exact same number of species, and maybe more importantly, certainly more importantly, not the same kinds of species occurred in each pond. This clearly contrasts with, or contradicts, Clements' prediction about what you should find. Clements would argue that particular associations of zooplankton should always occur together because they've evolved to be associated with each other.
Gleason's view of unpredictability, by contrast, would say, no, this is exactly what you'd expect. Why? Because it's just a matter of chance which of these particular zooplankton species find themselves first in a pond. And once you've got one species in, it's go into a pond, it's going to set the ecological progression of that pond on a different trajectory than another pond that happened to start with another zooplankton species. So Jenkins' experiment and many experiments like that clearly support Gleason's view that particular assemblages of species are unpredictable and that we should think of communities as Gleason did as um, the assemblage of individualistic species. Well, as a consequence of this kind of work, in recent years, really actually only over the last several decades, ecologists in general have now turned their attention away from studies designed to describe regular patterns of succession and instead have begun to try to characterize patterns of disturbance in communities. The idea being that it's how communities are disturbed that may actually tell us more about some, uh, something about the species we might expect to find in um, that community. So in addition to going out and measuring things like abundance and, 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 and distribution of species, ecologists have also begun to describe patterns and nature of disturbances or what are called the disturbance regimes of communities and ecosystems. And it's interesting that in some cases the disturbance regime of an ecosystem may tell you more about what the number and diversity of species living in that ecosystem are is than anything else. This idea, the idea that the disturbance regime of an ecosystem actually predicts more about what kinds of species or numbers of species you'll find there has been called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Now, it's kind of a funny name for a hypothesis. Why is it the intermediate disturbance hypothesis? Well, the reason for this is that if you look at communities that have experienced either very frequent and very severe disturbances, or, on the other hand, you look at communities that have experienced relatively infrequent and mild disturbances, what you find is that in either case, those communities tend to have relatively fewer species in them as compared to ex communities that are experiencing some intermediate level of disturbance. Now, several factors seem to account for this pattern. If a disturbance um, occurs at too high a rate or is too severe, then those few species that can actually colonize an area are going to dominate that area. But there are only several, there, there's only a relatively limited number of species that are good colonizers. The, Habit, or the, the community can never develop into more of a species-rich community because it keeps getting wiped out by disturbances. So you expect to have a relatively low number of species, those species which are particularly good at getting in at early successional stages. On the other hand, if you have a community that is disturbed infrequently or not at all, then some species might get established in that community that are particularly specialized for living there and outcompete other species. If you have a few good competitors in an ecosystem or in a community, then it's hard for any other species to get in there. And so species that suffer relatively low disturbances, again, are likely to have fewer species in them. But, but ecosystems that, dis, uh, that experience a relatively intermediate level of disturbance actually may have the best of both worlds. Parts of those habitats are going to be changed frequently. For example, in a forest, if you have sort of an irregular pattern of tree falls that come from, say, violent thunderstorms that don't occur too often and aren't too widespread, you'll have in that forested community both parts of that forest, which are, if it's a North Carolina Piedmont forest, mature oaks, and parts of that forest, which are what we would call tree light gaps which contain very different kinds of species. So if you look at the community as a whole, you'll see a much more heterogeneous combination of species reflecting the much more complex structure of this particular area that suffers an intermediate level of disturbance. Well, in today's lecture, what we've seen is how the specific assemblage of species that we can find that we find in a biological community may have as much to do with chance events in history as it does with the kinds of ecological interactions and um, ecosystem functions that we've talked about up to this point. 
In the next lecture, we're going to continue on this theme of asking how history and chance affects the abundance and distribution of species by looking at how we might explain even broader patterns in the occurrence of species over long periods of time or broader areas of space.